Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm U.S. Naval War College welcome to Ambassador Richard Haas. Appreciate it. <laughs> what Admiral Carter didn't say is that when I spoke here then, uh, about halfway through, a streaker went across the stage. <laughs> I'm trusting we will not have a repeat of that uh, searing experience tonight. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, Admiral Carter's just been here uh, for two, two months or so, he and his uh, wife, so I really, uh, along with you, uh, wish them uh, an extraordinary experience here. The Navy has clearly sent you one of, uh, one of its best, and this institution is one of its best. Indeed, this institution to me represents something that's extraordinary in this country, uh, but really in the institutions of the military. It's the, it's the part of America where we, we most invest in our people. There's, there's nothing else like it in, a, in our society. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real tribute to the military that it understands and appreciates what the, the ultimate resource is, which is the men and women in uniform. And it's schools like, like this one that, that make a, a tremendous uh, difference. And indeed, I actually think the rest of society would do well to, uh, to, to emulate it. It's also good to see uh, Ambassador Peters here. And, uh, one of my uh, first colleagues, Bing West. Bing and I worked at the Pentagon back in uh, 1979. I can't do the math, that's so long ago, but uh, uh, it's, it's great to see him. Uh, great to see him here. And uh, clearly none of you is a tennis fan or you wouldn't be here. Uh, <laughs> US Open finals are, are going on while we, uh, while we sit here, but uh, Good to see you have this, uh, th these priorities. One other thing, I actually learned uh, one other person I want to single out, uh, Professor uh, Tim Jackson, TJ, about to step down after really a, a life in the Navy and a career here. And it's just someone who, again, uh, what he's done and how he's done it really exemplifies, uh, I think, uh, what is best uh, about this country. So TJ, Godspeed. What I want to do is uh, tonight talk about American grand strategy, because it's what you asked me to do. It's rather uncharacteristic for me to do what I was asked to do, but I thought I'd make an exception uh, in this case. Uh, what I'm gonna do, though, in the beginning, though, is to uh, start with a few definitions. Now, I realize that's a bit academic, but then I figured, what the hell? I mean, to call something academic can't be pejorative here. Uh, where I come from, if you call something academic in New York or Washington, people immediately tune, your, tune you out. But I figure here I can get away with it. If I can't, we're all in trouble. Uh, so let me begin with three definitions. Uh, and what the, it's the definitions for foreign policy, the national security, and grand strategy. And I want to talk about the three briefly at the beginning, only because so often they are used interchangeably. And I've come to think uh, over the years that that represents real intellectual confusion. Uh, and it's confusion that has consequences, almost never uh, good. Or to put it another way, these are distinctions with differences. And that if we don't understand the differences among these three terms, foreign policy, national security, and grand strategy, we won't get it right about what it is we do as a country. So foreign policy is, is in some ways the, the most familiar. Uh, it's what a country does abroad. And that obviously involves the determination of objectives and the means, uh, the tools, both the choice of tools, the, the, the weighting of the various tools, uh, the actual use of the, the, the tools for achieving these, uh, the objectives. So foreign policy, by definition, is something that is done over there. National security is something that is bigger than foreign uh, policy. It's not just bigger, though. It's also much more, fun, it's much more fundamental. And it's what a country does abroad, yes. But national security is also what a country does at home. And it's what it does in both of these spheres, 
to promote uh, its interests. And the interests can range from physical safety and security to the resilience of the uh, society and the uh, economy to reducing dependencies on forces out there that affect us but cannot be uh, controlled to general what we do to, uh, as a society to promote well-being. And let me say, I'm going to talk mainly in the context of the United States. But definitionally, there's nothing about this in any way that is American. The concepts of uh, foreign policy, national security, and grand strategy apply to every uh, country on the, uh, on, the, on the planet. So national security embraces what is called here homeland security. Uh, energy policy, the, the capacity to produce uh, economically, goods, services, what have you, to reduce dependencies, be it dependencies on energy or other minerals or, or inflows of, uh, of capital. And the tools of national security, the elements of uh, national security then are everything from armed services, yes, uh, but also intelligence, diplomacy, trade policy, foreign assistance programs, but also education, schools, the quality of one's schools, uh, infrastructure, the quality of one's bridges, tunnels, ports, rail, electricity grid, uh, immigration policy, the ability to uh, attract and retain the uh, most talented people in this uh, global competition for, for human capital, to investment, again, whether it is in infrastructure or, or, or people, or what have you. So if I could leave you with one image, it is this, is to think of national security as a, as a coin. And one side of the coin is, is foreign policy, but the other side of the coin is, is domestic, and economic, and, and, and social. So foreign policy is an element of national security, but in no way is it a, a cinnamon, synonym no way is it uh, the totality of, uh, of, of national security. And if nothing else tonight, I hope none of you will ever use these words interchangeably. Uh, they are uh, differences, cause, and, cause, and I'll come back to this later, but the fact that national security does reflect things quote unquote domestic and economic and social uh, means that when we think about national security, we just can't think about it as looking outwards. It also requires that we, look at, that we think about it looking inwards. And which leads me to grand strategy. And grand strategy is a third notion, related but again, but again different. And yes, uh, it's, it's based upon foreign policy and more fundamentally on national security, but then it is what you do given that. So you make an assessment of what constitutes your national security, but then it's what you do about it. And the reason, so yes, you assess interests and commitments, you uh, assess the threats and challenges now and, and over time. You uh, then have to take into account that resources are limited. You can't do everything everywhere, every time. Indeed, public policy, of which all of this is an important element, is about choice. Or to put it another way, it's about priorities. Uh, one of my quick rules of thumb is if I ask someone how, what their priorities are and how many they've got, once they get above about three or four, I've concluded that they don't have a good working definition of the word priority. Uh, it's got to be just a, uh, a, a, a few things. Again, because resources, not just financial resources, by the way, or military resources, but resources of every type, including uh, attention of policymakers, of, of an attentive public, resources are limited. So grand strategy essentially, again, begins with national security, but it goes on to say, given opportunities, given challenges, given threats, given available resources, and so forth, what is it we're going to focus on? What is it we're going to devote a significant chunk of, of our capacity uh, to doing? So it's about choice, and grand strategy is about, uh, about judgment. I'm going to say something about it later. But let me uh, take a step back now to talk about national security. And I've been giving it a lot of thought. And this country, the United States national security. 
I've come to think that there are three principal threats to the national security of the United States. But I bet I would surprise at least some of you if I went on to say that I don't think it's China or Russia or any other single country uh, in the world. Or to put it another way, the 21st century is unfolding in fundamentally different ways than the 20th century and the centuries that preceded it. The principal dynamics of international relations, of world history, for the last several centuries have essentially been great power competition that often spilled over into conflict. In the 20th century, for example, you had two world wars, and then for four decades you had a, a cold war. And when, the, when you think about the history of the 20th century, from a global point of view, uh, it's as much those three conflicts, two of which were violently and violent and costly and destructive on scales we've never seen, and the Cold War, which for the most part was not violent, sometimes was when it was thought, fought through proxies, but mercifully stayed cold, as opposed to becoming hot, which would have been catastrophic in, in, in the uh, in the nuclear in the in the nuclear age. And what I'm simply saying is there's no country out there right now facing the United States that has both the capacity and the inclination to be a great power rival. And that to me is one of the defining but also differentiating moments of our time. It may not always be that way. And there's lots of ways that such the history, if you will, could re revert to the norm. But for now and for the foreseeable future, uh, I don't believe the United States has, if you will, a traditional great power rival on the scale of anything like we saw in the 20th century or as was seen between and among the great powers in previous uh, centuries. Uh, there's some other facets of this world that I think it's also important to take into account before we look at the three threats. Uh, a tremendous distribution of power. So rather than having a couple of countries that dominate the world, which is classic, if you will, multipolarity, we actually have a world of widely distributed power uh, between and among states, but also other actors. It could be financial power lodged in this or that company or, or bank. It could be the power to reach people uh, through media. It could be the power of technology in handheld devices or, or, or tablets. It could be the destructive power of terrorist organizations uh, or pirate groups or drug cartels. But this is a world of distributed power. This is not a world of highly concentrated power. And indeed, most of the tendencies out there are centrifugal. So if I were to bet, if you will, I think this is the tendency uh, moving forward. You've got globalization as a reality. Essentially, the, the flows that are both vast and fast, enormous volume, uh, enormous velocities, crossing borders in ways that governments often cannot control. In some cases, they can't even uh, monitor. You've also, and an, or another way to think about it, as a measure, is you've got things out there that essentially, in some ways, integrate the world, bring it more together, uh, provide for order, economic interdependence, which makes countries think twice before being highly uh, disruptive, various types of regional and global organizations and arrangements. And then you've got all sorts of forces of disruption. The fact that there's enormous, an enormous gap between global challenges and global arrangements. So you've got countries like North Korea or like Iran or group like, uh, groups like uh, Hezbollah or Al Qaeda and its, uh, its offshoot. So you, you've got, if you will, competing forces. And one way to get ahead of ourselves to think about how this year will ultimately come to be known is, is how these forces balance out. How these, uh, the competition between forces of order and disorder ultimately uh, pans out over the following years and uh, decades. So this is the backdrop. This, I would argue, is the, the backdrop to this consideration of American national security. And as I said, I believe there are three threats or principal threats to it. One uh, is the one that we have largely experienced over the last decade or 15 years. And I would call it a strategic overreach. And this has been the uh, temptation of the United States, and often a temptation it couldn't resist, to try to do too much in the world. And in particular, to try to remake vast aspects 
of the greater Middle East. And if, I, if you allow me a generous definition of the Middle East, uh, essentially from Marrakesh all the way through uh, Afghanistan, where the United States has tried to remake uh, societies, particularly in, obviously, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. Iraq, I would argue, was an example of overreach or overstretch. Uh, I've described it elsewhere as an ill-advised war of choice. It was not a war the United States needed to uh, undertake, but it, it chose to. Afghanistan, I believe, was right at the beginning after 9-11. We're about to, to mark the 9-11 uh, again, uh, the anniversary of it. I believe what the United States did initially was totally warranted to basically oust the Taliban government after they would not uh, end their relationship with Al-Qaeda and turn them over to the United States and international authorities. Uh, where I think the United States strayed was when it tried to remake the society and the political system of Afghanistan in ways that run up against, in many ways, the history and traditions uh, of that uh, country. And I would simply say there's been a pattern of American uh, overreach trying to remake uh, other societies often with the military being the principal tool for, for so doing. I think we've often ignored local realities of history, of culture, of, of religion, of uh, society. And I believe that at times we have to understand that as strong as we are, and we're still first among equals, we're really first among unequals in the world, there are still limits to what the United States uh, can, can accomplish. This is, to me, not defeatism. This is simply realism. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. Uh, when I speak about the dangers of overreach, uh, the United States still must be uh, capable and willing to carry out wars of necessity, where our interests are vital and where no other tool other than the military uh, would work. And I even would argue we need to be prepared to undertake selective wars of choice, where while the interests might be less than vital, or where there might be tools available other than the military to do the job, the military still makes the most sense uh, in a kind of, when, when it's assessed on its own merits and compared to other uh, tools. All of which brings me to what I see as the second great threat to American national security, and it's not one I would have thought a couple of years ago. If you had had me here two years ago, I wouldn't have mentioned it. Indeed, when I wrote my last book, uh, Foreign Policy Begins at Home, it's not one that was uh, high on my concerns, but it's emerged. I was much more worried about overreach, but now I'm much more worried about the opposite, which is underreach. You come up with other words, <coughs> minimalism, isolationism, but what it, what it reflects is a very pinched or narrow view of this country's uh, interests and what needs to be done to uh, defend them. I, th I believe this, this, this worldview tends to underestimate the reality and power of globalization. Try as it might, the United States cannot become a giant gated community. Or to use another metaphor, you know, the world is not Las Vegas. You know, what happens there isn't gonna stay there. One way or another, things, people, what have you, uh, gets on the conveyor belt of, of, of globalization, and it could be terrorists, as we saw again on 9-11, but uh, as we constantly have to deal with, to proliferation, to uh, disease for a global pandemic, to uh, carbon and the whole challenge of uh, climate change or economic turmoil, as we've seen with the Eurozone uh, crisis. I believe the, uh, this emergence of underreach, if you will, is um, something of an overreaction. Uh, in part to Iraq and Afghanistan. I also believe it sets up a false choice or, between guns and butter, as though in order to have enough butter, you can't have enough guns. And the answer is we can and need to have enough of both. What this country now spends on defense is quite modest by historical uh, standards. It's quite modest compared to what we would or could spend if the threats uh, warranted it. And what ails us on the domestic side of the house in most instances is not a lack of resources, but rather it's the allocation of those resources. So to set up a guns versus butter debate and to basically say, if only we spent less on the military so we could spend more on domestic, to me, misunderstands the, the nature of what it would take to put into place effective economic, social, and domestic uh, 
policies. We spend, for example, twice the average of what the other advanced economies, the OECD countries, spend on health care. But the last I checked, Americans are not twice as healthy and they don't live twice as wrong, twice as long. So spending more doesn't always get you more. Uh, so again, the gun versus butter debate, I think, ignores the reality. It's, it's almost always in public life, it's how you spend is far more important than how much you spend. So to set up this tension, I would suggest is, is uh, wrong. Uh, let me suggest two economic parallels that explain, on, uh, I think, what is going on or why it's wrong, this kind of underreach. One is, for those of you who do study financial markets or invest at all, there's a pattern, uh, it's a pendulum pattern, where pen the pendulum swings too far. That's why we have bubbles, and that's why we go the other way. And I would think that because of strategic overreach, if you will, the national security pendulum in the United States went too far, so now we're swinging back. And as markets would predict, we're gonna to swing too far the other way. There's a, a temptation, if you will, to, to overreact. Uh, part of it, another economic metaphor that I find useful is uh, why underreach is so dangerous. For those of you who did Economics 101, there's no invisible hand out there in the geopolitical marketplace making things right. It, it ain't just gonna work by itself. Forces of order do not dominate over forces of disorder by themselves. It takes, if you will, the visible hand of agents who are promoting order, and there's no visible hand that's more capable and more central than the United States. So American withdrawal or American underreach is not going to be benign. Uh, we've got to get it right be between the uh, two. Uh, the Syrian debate, by the way, highlights a lot of this, what I'm talking about. And I think there's been examples of overreach in the debate about people who want us to jump in with both feet in the, uh, in the Civil War, to basically become a protagonist in the Civil War, which I believe uh, would be uh, ill-advised, unwise. Uh, as we should have learned by now, I got not just that local realities count, but uh, as difficult as it can be to oust an authoritarian or dictator, that often pales in comparison to the difficulty of putting something in his place that endures and is markedly better. And that to me is one of the, the continuing lessons of places like, uh, like Iraq, like Libya, and so forth. So we would be buying into, I believe, uh, an enormous amount. Uh, there's people going the other way. There's, uh, there are those who are saying we shouldn't get involved at all. We don't have a dog in that hunt, either uh, on the Civil War or on the, uh, the chemical weapons use by Syrian government uh, forces. And that, to me, uh, underestimates the consequences of a world in which, among other things, the use of weapons of mass destruction could become fairly uh, commonplace. On top of all this, I would argue that what the president has said and what he's done in his decision to go con to Congress has now added an entire new overlay of concerns, of interests, and of stakes on all these things. So I think for the United States not to react at this point would add to the uh, potential costs uh, of underreach. So again, happy to talk about this more afterwards, but I would argue a policy that we do need to respond uh, decisively to the um, use of chemical uh, weapons. That uh, we also should be arming those elements of the opposition that have agendas that we can support and that over time would sway the direction of the civil war. And that we should be doing it a lot on a humanitarian as well as strategic basis, in particular for Jordan, where such a large number of the, uh, the uh, refugees are going. The third threat to our national security is fundamentally different in kind. It's neither underreach nor overreach. But again, coming back to the definition of national security, that it's what goes on here as much as what goes on there, it's the fact that we're not getting it right here at home. It's the fact that our schools are increasingly not competitive. Uh, the United States doesn't rank at the top. Yes, our Stanfords and Harvards are the best. But as soon as you get below that, uh, our, many of our colleges aren't, even more important, our K through 12 schools are not. Lots of people line up around the world at American consulates because they want to go to an American university. Very few people line up around the world at American consulates because they want to go to a public school in our inner cities. But that is a much more uh, common educational experience for people in, in this society. Our infrastructure. I took the train up here today. 
we have many things. We do not have high-speed rail. Uh, anyone who's looked at our, our ports, our airports, and so forth knows that we simply uh, don't have the infrastructure we need. We'll see whether we can pass comprehensive immigration reform. But even if we do, and I think the jury's out, it's still not going to be a strategic immigration system in many ways, which is going to make it possible for much larger numbers of uh, the most talented and educated to, to come here and to, uh, to stay here. Uh, what worries me more than anything is the looming entitlement burden that the United States, uh, five, 10 years out, when people of my generation, when the baby boomers uh, are increasingly uh, retiring, we have a trajectory of uh, obligations that, we, that will simply bankrupt us. And increasingly, we'll be investing there, or not investing there, we'll be paying out there rather than investing. And at some point, the rest, you know, our debt will continue to grow. And the rest of the world will get tired of, of, of financing the American debt on current terms. And it will force interest rates to rise, not, to, not for the traditional reasons that interest rates rise, which is to cool an overheated economy, but simply to provide people with the return on capital that they will want in order to give them confidence to continue to fund our habits. And that will be a very bad day for the American economy because it will slow us down dramatically and we will be on a very bad cycle. We will then have to do structural reforms, but under much uh, worse uh, conditions. And what I think is at the heart of all these challenges socially and economically and domestically here is political dysfunction. It's not a lack of ideas. It's not that we don't know what to do about these issues though some are awfully complicated, like the healthcare system. But in most instances, uh, what is lacking is simply political ability uh, to come up with uh, compromises that are at least partial uh, solutions. So all of this, uh, if you take what I'm saying uh, together, if we therefore have these three challenges abroad, uh, two, uh, the three challenges for our national security, overreach, underreach, and political dysfunction here at home, we need a grand strategy that takes it all into account, that uh, avoids doing too much and too little abroad, that basically comes up with Goldilocks and addresses uh, our needs here in the, uh, in, in the home front. It's going to be hard. It's actually harder to come up with a grand strategy now simply because we don't face a single obvious dramatic existential threat. In a funny sort of way, this business of, of national security was less difficult uh, early at times in the Cold War, not that it was ever easy, but simply because there was a degree of intellectual clarity and there was a degree of uh, necessity. But now, in a funny sort of way, we've got more choice and it's harder to come up with the answers and it's harder to build domestic political support for particular, uh, for particular grand uh, strategies. So what is it, though, uh, we should do? I have a proposal. Uh, my proposal I call restoration for an American grand uh, strategy. The idea would be uh, it would restore the foundations of American uh, power, but it would also restore what I would call the proper or more traditional balances in what it is the United States uh, does in the world and here at home vis-a-vis -vis the world. Or another way to say, within foreign policy, it would put, it would slightly reduce the emphasis on the greater Middle East not eliminate it, not withdraw from it, but reduce it. Think of dials or rheostats as your mental image. Uh, and it would slightly increase the emphasis we played above all to the Asia Pacific. And then secondly, besides rebalancing between or among regions, it would also place slightly less emphasis on the foreign policy side of the national security coin and more emphasis on the domestic side of the uh, national security coin. The reason for the first rebalancing away from the Middle East and towards Asia is Asia where the, is where the 21st century is largely going to be played out. It's where the world's great economies interact. It's where the world's most populous and increasingly powerful countries interact. Uh, it's uh, a part of the world where the political frameworks are very thin. If Europe is the part of the world with the most developed political frameworks, Asia is actually quite weak. You've got the most dynamism. You've got growing amounts of uh, nationalism. It also happens to be a part of the world where US tools tend to be particularly useful. Our diplomatic tools, our air presence, our naval presence, trade promotion, and so forth. It's part of the world where we can, we can actually do things. Middle East, by contrast, I would argue, is not a part of the world where the great powers are, are present. They're not. 
It's also uh, not a part of the world where American tools are particularly well suited. And we've learned that over the years and what, when we've tried to remake uh, societies. I actually think the Middle East is in the early stages of what will be a prolonged period of uh, self-definition and sorting out. It likely will go on, not just for years, but, but decades. Uh, I think uh, instability and turbulence not just can, but will become the new normal, both within societies over questions of political legitimacy, sectarian differences, what have you, but also regionally, uh, whether it's Shia Sunni feuds or Persian Arab uh, feuds. But I just think this is gonna be a long, long, long sorting out. And the United States uh, can't dictate solutions. We can't uh, and shouldn't uh, try. We can have influence, yes but our influence will be, will be limited. And I simply think that is a uh, fact of, uh, of life. I think the other thing we should do is, besides rebalancing between the, the foreign, between one region and another, is the rebalancing between the foreign and the domestic. And it comes back to something I said at the outset. This is actually a moment because we don't face a great power rival. There's a powerful strategic case that we should take advantage of what I would call something of a strategic respite. And again, don't get me wrong here, I'm not saying the world, we should or could or ignore the world, but because there is no great power rival right now, the United States does have both the luxury and the necessity of tending a bit more, a bit more, to the home front. And the idea would be to rebuild the foundations of American economic power. We're only growing at roughly half the post-World War II historic average. For most of the post-War II era, the United States grew at around 3.3, 3.4%. We're only growing at about half that. So we need to get our growth up. There's lots of things we can and should uh, do to do it. If we do those things, I believe it doesn't simply help us domestically and raise the standard of living or the quality of life, but it gives us the resources that should discourage the emergence of a, of a geopolitical competitor on a large scale. You would have to be foolish to take the United States on geopolitically around the world if we're growing at three, three and a half percent again and generating all the resources. And if someone were so foolish to do so, it would then give us the resources to, to, deal, to, to put forward a response that would be uh, robust and then some. So this is not an argument for isolationism, but rather it's an argument for rebalancing or reweighting the various components of national security, taking advantage of some short-term considerations and positioning this country for the long term. And the two principal guideposts, if you will, are less, less emphasis on trying to remake the insides of the Middle East, more emphasis on trying to shape the, the emerging geopolitics of the Asia Pacific, and more emphasis on restoring the economic vitality and social cohesion of this country uh, uh, here, here at home. Uh, will we do this? Uh, I don't know, we've got powerful special interests in this country domestically that often compete with the national interest. Uh, so you know, I can't stand up here and be sanguine and say uh, we will get it right. I would just, for reasons I mentioned before, say that I hope we get it right because the stakes are enormous. Uh, the stakes are enormous to this country given our inability to insulate ourselves uh, from developments in the world. And the stakes are enormous for the world because if the United States does not take the lead in promoting international order, I don't see any other country out there that has the capacity and habits and inclination to do just that. Maybe some countries will emerge, but the European countries lack the capacity and most of the emerging countries lack the habits and inclination. They're much more preoccupied with domestic developments, essentially with their rise rather than with a larger uh, global role. So it's really up to the United States to, to play this role for the foreseeable future, but to do it in a way that is smart, that uh, again, reflects uh, limits to its resources, limits to what it can accomplish in the world, and the, and the need, if you will, to replenish the, uh, the, the, the reservoir. So this is what grand strategy is. It is uh, it's, it's, it's based upon, again, uh, an assessment that you can't do everything everywhere, every time. On the other hand, you don't want to go to the other extreme. 
and you, you don't want to uh, stop doing things. And it's uh, a lot of judgment, a lot of choices. It's extraordinarily uh, difficult to decide what to do. It's then also difficult to, to get the public support for doing it because it's, it's, it doesn't fit very easily on a, on a bumper sticker. But, but simply because it is uh, hard to do uh, doesn't mean that it, it doesn't need doing. And that to me is a uh, part of the challenge of leadership for uh, current leadership and for its uh, successors. This is essentially uh, you know, what's out there for now and for the uh, foreseeable future. And if, if we get it right, if the United States essentially adopts some version of uh, what I would describe as our restoration, I would think the, uh, the legacy of that will be long and will be good. And it would position this country to play the kind of role that uh, I believe it needs to play for, for years, indeed decades, uh, to come. It will, it will pay for itself many times over. And if it doesn't, again, um, I think the forces of disorder will, will, will grow uh, considerably. It's interesting, and I'll, I'll end with this, and then we'll open it up. You know, here it is now, next year. It's, it's September 2013, so roughly in uh, 14 months, it's going to be November uh, 2014. And here we are this week, it's September 9th, it's 9-9. So in two days we're gonna be celebrating 9-11, or marking 9-11. In 14 months, we're gonna be marking 11-9. What is 11-9? 11-9 is the day the Berlin Wall came down. And by next year, it'll be 11-9, will be 25 years, uh, 1989. And it's interesting that this geopolitical era that has evolved since the Cold War is still nameless. And the reason it's still nameless is that the character of the era has not asserted itself. There's lots of competing tendencies. There's lots of developments. It's not that, you know, history is obviously still going on. But no particular historical pattern has imposed itself or imposed its personality or character on the uh, age. It's still up for grabs. And what's so interesting about the, the choices facing the US in, in its grand strategy is that by what the United States chooses to do and chooses not to do and how it chooses to implement whatever it is it chooses uh, to do will go a long way towards uh, determining the character of the, uh, of the era. And you know, uh, most of you out there are, are younger than me. This will be the era that you, know, you, you, you spend the bulk of your lives. Uh, be the year you'll spend the bulk of your, your, your careers. And it's rare to be at a moment in history where so much is uncertain, where history could really play out in such different ways. But that's exactly where we are. And it could be a 21st century that could be uh, marked largely by forms of international collaboration and integration. It could be uh, quite peaceful, quite prosperous, lots of open societies, a very benign 21st century. It also, uh, you know, where the, among others, the major powers cooperate and collaborate on dealing with global challenges, trying to and manage to close the gap between the challenges and the arrangements put in place to deal with them. Or it could be very different. It could be a 21st century in which the uh, powers are at one another, possibly leading to conflicts of one sort or another, and where they're unable or unwilling to compromise and find ways of dealing with regional and global challenges. And it's just a fundamentally different uh, history and trajectory in life, uh, depending upon how this plays out. And uh, my only point is, uh, more than any other single factor that I can think of, it will be American, you know, United States, it will be what the United States chooses to do in its own uh, definition of its grand strategy and then how it implements it. It's not the only factor out there. Other countries are gonna have to decide what they're gonna do. And the United States is not in a position to control history or determine history but it still has the, uh, if it's a canvas, to switch metaphors, it has the largest single paintbrush and the biggest can of paint of anybody uh, else out there. So this debate about, uh, to end where I began, this debate may sound academic, but it's not. This debate about uh, how we define our national security and then how we, how we act on it uh, will, will be as consequential as any uh, than any of us will uh, either experience or given the, the people in this room in many cases, uh, shape and participate in. Thank you very much.
<laughs> now I am told there are microphones, yes, that have legs on them, uh, or people carrying microphones. Uh, so. I think now it's open on anything I've either discussed or haven't discussed. That uh, one way or another, however directly or tangentially, deals with these questions of uh, national security, foreign policy, grand strategy, from the specific to the large, from the immediate to the long term. So uh, anything is fair game. And I don't know what the rules are here. Do people introduce themselves when they speak and stand up? Certainly, sir. I am uh, Andrew Mitchell. I am from the State Department. I'm here with the uh, College of Naval Warfare, a senior class. I'd like to thank you first for coming and speaking to us. It's a great honor to hear you speak. Um, respectfully, I would submit that I think you're overly optimistic about the situation in the Middle East when you say that uh, violence and disarray will become the new normal. I think we've actually passed that point and it has become the new normal. Uh, in light of that, um, you spoke and reflected the views that the administration has has said in pivoting away from the Middle East, more focusing on the Far East. And my question to you would be, as we make that transition, what happens to our historic allies? I would say Saudi Arabia, Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. And in that context, I would note that beyond the much rhetoric that's been made about our military assistance to Saudi Arabia, our slowness, our hesitancy to forward our, our non-military assistance since the fall of Hosni Mubarak has actually left us with almost no seat at the table in discussions as what is going on with that country now. How can we make this pivot, which I agree is a, is a good idea, without abandoning those who've supported us? Well, it's hard for me to answer that because I'm still taken aback by the fact that I was accused of being too optimistic on the Middle East. <laughs> I've been accused of so much in my life, but, uh, but that, that's the first. Uh, and my, my, my kids even call me Debbie Downer, so, it's, uh, <laughs> so I'm a bit taken aback. Uh, so let me give you a couple of uh, reactions. As I said, I do think we're in the, to use a baseball, pardon me for sports analogies, but if this were a baseball uh, game, we're maybe in the second inning. I actually think what began the event several years ago, which were misnamed in Arab Spring, uh, are, are just beginning to play out. And the reason they were misnamed is spring lasts three months. This is anything but a seasonal phenomena, and spring is positive. It's not clear to me this has a positive uh, end, much less trajectory. So I, I basically have banned the phrase Arab Spring, or unless, unless you say so-called Arab Spring. Because I really, it's really the upheavals. That's what these are. These are, these are historic, uh, even where the old order in the Middle East, which was largely an authoritarian order, has largely either disappeared or has come under real pressure. But a new order hasn't taken its place. Or you had one temporarily take its place in Egypt, which in, now there's been a, a counter-revolution, if you will, uh, there, there's no order in places like Syria. There's diminishing order in places like Iraq and uh, certainly in Libya. Uh, Bahrain is trying to figure out if it, what, where, it, where it goes, and it's, it hasn't come up yet with a, a formula. Even the Saudis, I would argue, are potentially vulnerable. That um, because of demographic increases, because of the politicization of a lot of uh, the world, because of the corruption that's associated with the regime, uh, I think there's, there's potential for instability uh, there. One thing that's happened, I think you were getting to this, is that in the short run, uh, a lot of these countries are going kind of their own way. And I talked before about the distribution of, of power. One of the things we're seeing is uh, independent foreign policies, much more. So the UAE or Saudi Arabia are pursuing their goals, say, in Egypt, and are funding rather unconditionally the, the current uh, military slash transitional government in Egypt, whereas other governments like Qatar were going the other way, supporting the, the Ikhwan, the Muslim uh, brothers. There's a sense that as America does a little bit less, others are filling something of a, of a geopolitical uh, vacuum. I think that's a... Uh, that is a, one of the realities of the modern Middle East. We're seeing breakdowns of states. 
militiaization in many cases. Uh, what you see in Syria, for example, is uh, you see a war that's, yes, between fact factions, if you will, or large groups in Syrian society, but there's overlays of outsiders that are influencing it, and in turn, the war is influencing them. So that it's, it's going in, a, in, in both directions. Uh, I think for the United States, there has to be a strategic determination about a couple of things. Uh, one is, if I'm right, we don't want to get in the middle of civil wars directly. And that's where, for example, it's one of the reasons I favor arming elements of an opposition we can live with rather than Americans getting directly uh, involved. And I wish we had done it sooner and fairly large scale. Uh, but I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, too late. Uh, I think the United States at times has to make a decision about whether it's going to focus on what country, on what governments are and what governments do. And by that I mean to what extent is the focus of American foreign policy on the character and nature of societies? And to what extent is American foreign policy focusing more on the external and foreign policy behaviors of, of governments? And to what extent should we demand certain standards be met? And if so, how high should those standards be? And how quickly should they be met in terms of democratization? Or to what extent should the United States basically uh, be more patient and be more modest about the trajectories it asks these uh, societies uh, to take. As you probably can tell, I lean towards the sense, the side of being more modest and more uh, uh, patient. But I also think at the, at the end of the day, let me just say that if your pessimism and my pessimism are essentially right, that the, the new normal in the Middle East will be turbulence. And it, it, it's, it's quite possible that uh, it will go through uh, the instabilities we've seen in some countries are two things. The countries that have already experienced instability are not necessarily going to sort themselves out quickly. And countries that haven't experienced instability are not going to be immune. One of my, uh, I've got two pieces of wisdom about the Middle East. One is that the enemy of your enemy can still be your enemy. And, and the other is that things, sometimes things have to get worse before they get even worse. And so it, it's, it's not quite obvious to me. Again, we're poised on the threshold of a uh, breakthrough. And then what the United States then has to do is, is be prepared to carry out a very inconsistent policy. And by that, I mean we're going to have to look at each situation and figure out what are the interests, what is the influence, what are the stakes, what is it we could accomplish at what cost. So the idea that we're going to have a consistent one size fits fits all policy towards the Middle East is, to me, uh, wildly unrealistic. Uh, we're going to have to be much more uh, careful about what it is we say, about expressing preferences. We can't forever be saying different leaders must go without, the, without having first thought out what would it take for them to go and what are we prepared to do, not only to see them go, but to put something better in their place. And by the way, what are the odds that something better could be put in its place? I just think the United States is going to have to be much more careful uh, and in terms of both its assessments and then in what, what its actions are. Uh, but this is the, what's going on in the Middle East is really the stuff, it's the big stuff of history. And I actually think, again, it's, uh, there was this post-colonial order that had largely existed for half a century or more, in some cases for a century, if you think about even the colonial era, the, the, the map of the Middle East, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, it's quite possible before, the, before this is all worked out that not only will you have massive changes within countries, and more than one change, as we've already seen in Egypt, but you could have changes between and among countries. The borders may, current borders may not exist uh, exactly the same way and so forth. Uh, so we actually need a much more strategic, long-term approach uh, to, to this part of the world that I think is going to be turbulent and difficult to influence for, for a long, long time. Sir. Uh, sir, I'm uh, Lieutenant Commander Farad from Bangladesh Navy. And my question is about, you're talking about the focusing from Middle East to the Asia. So if you see at Middle East now, the Egypt, Syria, and if Iran, so the situation is not good. Now, due to the resource constraint, if you uh, divert from the Middle East to the uh, Asia, so you are actually opening two fronts. 
So if the situation becomes volatile at a time in these two regions, then I think it's going to be very difficult for you with the resource constraint. Well, in Asia, which again to me is a part of the world which I think is highly important because you've got the enormous economies, major powers, we have several allies, uh, formal allies uh, there. But I really do think that Asia, more than any other part of the world, will largely determine the, the, the contours of, this, of the coming geopolitical uh, era. Uh, I don't see us opening a front. I see American involvement now making it much less likely that a front opens up. Uh, I think the United States being more involved in the Asia Pacific, cons working with its allies, particularly with the Japans and South Koreas, but also keeping open all sorts of communication with China, having a presence there, clarity about what America is prepared to do, what it's prepared to tolerate, uh, promotion of regional frameworks, economic and political military. This is the way to keep Asia largely stable. Asia has been remarkably stable for the most part for three plus decades. It's enjoyed phenomenal economic success, but now the economic success is slowing and I don't see it coming back to the levels it had. And you're seeing nationalism rising. You're seeing greater assertiveness. Uh, so you, you're losing the lubricant, if you will, of, of great economic success. And political military issues are beginning to arise, come to the fore, but there aren't the institutions or the relationships to manage them. Asia, just take another 30 seconds, has never gone through the reconciliations that have characterized Europe. You have, for example, in Europe, Franco-German reconciliation is the, at the core of post-World War II order in Europe. And then you had the coal and steel community, which became the economic community, which is now the EU. There's nothing like that parallel in Asia. You haven't had Chinese-Japanese or Japanese-Korean or Russian-Japanese reconciliation. The, the differences go back 60, 70, 80 or more years in some cases. Uh, you don't have the the arrangements of place, you have several economic arrangements, there's virtually no diplomatic, political, military arrangements that exist in, in Asia. It's quite brittle and quite thin. So my argument is since the consequences of co conflict would be enormous for the United States and the world, the United States needs to get more involved, not to open up a front, but to prevent the front from opening up. In the Middle East, a front, it's not a front, in the Middle East, instability has gone is out there in great ways. And the real question is, what can the United States do to dampen down the instability? What can it do to see the instability doesn't spread? What can it do to insulate itself from some of the instability? There's not solutions. You know, I find a really useful distinction in English uh, between the words uh, problem and conditions. Problems have solutions. Conditions that most you have is the ability to manage them. I would suggest the Middle East is a condition to be managed. It's not a problem to be solved. And the best the United States can do for the coming year is figure out ways of helping to manage it. And again, it's through using influence where, where we can. It may mean doing this with arming or this with economic aid uh, or this with diplomacy. Uh, the fact that we're having this energy transformation going on gives us a little bit of uh, freedom. You know, we can't be aloof, but it gives us a little bit of uh, time and space, uh, a little bit of cushion, I guess is the word I would uh, Use, but we have to have a much more discreet or discriminating policy towards the Middle East uh, to try to deal with the instability that's already there. And hopefully, it, it, it doesn't go worse. I think the biggest strategic question for the United States in the Middle East will ultimately not be Syria, it won't be Egypt, it will be Iran, and whether the United, what the United States prepared to tolerate or not. And I think that we haven't talked about it tonight, but I think that will be the biggest uh, question. And for me, it's it's the f near term policy question that could have the greatest implications for American grand, stra grand strategy and national security for the, the next couple of, uh, the, the next couple of uh, uh, years. But essentially, I would say uh, the strategic goals ought to be to try to keep things from getting out of hand in the Middle East and prevent things from unraveling in the Asia Pacific is the way I would put forward the strategic uh, approach. Sir. Sir, Commander Bo from Naval Expeditionary Combat Command, uh, student at Strategy and Warfare. Uh, Naval Expeditionary Combat Command and many of our sister services, we've stood up civil affair teams and turning young officers into 
you know, combat diplomats. Uh, maybe overuse of the word, but is there something in your four decades that you've seen that we're doing different in the diplomatic corps in these theaters where the State Department's not coming with the same emphasis? Okay, okay this is where I'm going to possibly alienate Ambassador Peters and others who watch this. I have a couple, I, I actually have some strong views about this. Not necessarily right, not necessarily informed, they're just strong. Uh, <laughs> One, the State Department ought to focus mostly on diplomacy. I think they ought to focus mostly on what I would call, what I called earlier, foreign policy. Uh, promoting American interests out there, uh, reporting back, doing diplomacy, consulting with countries, uh, and so forth, trying to shape their behaviors. That, to me, is what diplomats do. And that ought to be what foreign service officers and the State Department largely does, also promote investment, what have you. I do not think turning either American soldiers or American diplomats into nation builders is a good idea. In both cases, it's a distraction for what their missions are and what their training largely is. Uh, I think the military ought to largely uh, fight wars and do special missions where uh, force is uh, required. You can also do training and all that and, and advising, but that's, but uh, ought not to be doing nation building, what you call it co combat diplomats. That ought not to be the, the norm for the military. Nor ought we to have kind of Peace Corps diplomats be the norm for the State Department. Uh, very different skill sets. Uh, what I've argued historically is that if we are thinking about large scale nation building, if for whatever reason we want to do it, that we ought to have a reserve force do this that, that's modeled very much on the military reserve. And we ought to have a civilian reserve, could be retired military, could be retired police, retired engineers, or it doesn't have to be retired. It could be people with these skill sets and with language sets. We'd have it all in a database and we'd say, gee, we need 20,000 people who go into country X who speak language Y and who are really good at the following skill sets. We'd have it and we'd say, okay. And people would sign up for this and they would spend uh, weekends and however it is, like the reserves. And this would be what we would do when we thought we had circumstances that required. But we would have people who were trained for this, who had the real world experience, the careers, and we would deploy them. So I actually think we need something on a large scale like that, rather than ask either our diplomats or our soldiers to take on these missions, which are at least one or two steps removed from it is, I think, what they're trained to do, what they're best at, and what we need them uh, to do. So I would just go in a very different uh, direction. I don't want to ignore this side of the room. There's a gentleman in the back. So I'm Commander John Craig from the United Kingdom, and I'm the Royal Naval Exchange Officer in the Joint Military Operations Faculty here. Uh, a question about grand strategy. Yeah, the name implies long-term vision with some form of desired end state. But what we're talking about tonight sounds like short-term reaction, uh, and you highlighted your concerns about uh, political dysfunction and the fact that uh, parties can't agree. So, so do you think it's even possible to have grand strategy in a Western democracy with an election cycle? It's actually the subject I struggled with as hard as any other in writing my last book. Uh, there's a pattern out there, uh, certainly for mature democracies, and they're struggling. And there, there's a famous uh, social scientist, sociologist in the United States in the 20th century, Man Olson, and basically wrote about the, the tendency of uh, when the state introduces certain types of reforms. And if one says in this country, to use an America's example, say, goes back to the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, a lot of these things that were associated with the, the Roosevelt years to get us out of the Depression and to provide a safety net for the American people. What Olson predicted, and alas has come true, is that powerful special interests would glom on to these reforms and become advocates not for their perpetuation and extension. And that's what's happened. So a perfect example, 
And now I'm going to alienate anyone over 50 in the room, but so be it. Uh, is the AARP, the American Association for Retired People. 37, whatever it is, million people, you know, and, every, and most people I know over 50 are members of it. Why? Because you get you know, discounts on your automobile insurance and whatever. But most people aren't aware that they are one of the most powerful lobbies in America. And a percentage of the very small money they get from you, but since it's multiplied times 37 million, it adds up real fast, goes to lobbying and essentially making it impossible for us to even have a serious conversation, much less do anything, about uh, Medicare reform, which is the single biggest looming entitlement obligation facing this country, and there's no way on God's green earth that we can fund. Uh, so this is an example where mature democracies have real problems. You see it on gun control. You see it on lots of issues. Now, you can, there's only two ways I know of competing with it. One is you have countervailing special interests. So for example, the mayor, I live in New York City, so Mike Bloomberg is essentially funding individuals and groups to take on the NRA, and he's supporting candidates or opposing candidates based upon their position on gun control. You may like it, you may disagree, that's not the point. The point is, he's basically said, the only way to weaken the role of the NRA, it's never gonna happen top down, it can only happen bottom up. I want to try to set up a countervailing special interest. There's some efforts to start that on uh, the Social Security and Medicare issues, but it's an enormous if, gap, shall we say, between these startup efforts uh, and the um, groups like the AARP. The only other way to then, out of choice, to take them on would be through a leadership where a president would say, I'm going to make this one of the centerpieces if you will, coming back to what I said, of my approach to grand strategy. And I would say that unless the United States get its entitlement obligations under control, we are setting ourselves up f for a major debt crisis. And we are going to leave ourselves vulnerable to the, either the vagaries of the market or vagaries of central bankers. And nobody wants to do that. If you doubt me, just ask people in Greece. And it's not immediate, but it's probably 10 or 12 years off. But you can't change entitlement uh, obligations on a dime. It's a little bit of um, perfect experience. It's, it's like turning around an aircraft carrier. If someone's 58 or 60 or 62, you can't suddenly say we're going to raise the retirement age uh, a couple of years. We're going to change uh, Medicare, uh, what you're going to receive dramatically. But if someone's 45, you can because people have enough time to internalize it and plan their lives. It's not imminent. You don't get the pushback. So the fact that we're not dealing with these issues now means that in 10 or 15 years, when all of the chicks come home to roost, we're going to have a real problem. And it's going to be too late to do anything with them, except on fairly draconian terms. And it's going to be a very painful process for the American economy and uh, American society. Those are, really, those are the only two things I can think of to deal with these uh, issues. And I think for mature democracies, it's tough. It's the reason that Europe's going through a lot of what it's going through, particularly in Southern Europe. It's out there for the United States. Uh, it's also true, by the way, of, of emerging countries who have their own sets of problems. I think governance, uh, domestic governance is tough. And the fact that governments, in many cases, have lost their monopoly or domination of media and information because of the diffusion of technologies has made it even tougher. So it's, uh, it's going to be rough sailing, to use another nautical metaphor. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to avoid them. Uh, but I, but I, I think your point's legitimate. And it's one of the real question marks. It's, you know, the reason I wrote the book I just wrote was for the first time in my adult life, I'm not feeling sanguine that we're going to get it right. And when I said the biggest threat faced the United States is really our domestic politics and our ability. Uh, it's for the first time I'm not sure we're going, to get, we're going to be able to make the adjustments we should make. And I'm not saying we won't, but uh, I'm just, you know, Churchill had the, you're a Brit, Churchill had the famous quote, you know, Americans can, can be counted on to do the right thing, but only after they've tried everything else. <laughs> well, we're, we're, sti we're clearly still in the trying everything else phase. Uh, the question is, when will we get that? When will we run through that phase? And will it be soon enough? And that's what I don't know. I don't know how the timelines work out. But you, you asked, I think, one of the big questions uh, out there. Sure. Uh, 
My name is Heath Twitchell, and I'm an adjunct professor of strategy and war here at the Cooper War College. I'd like to go back to Syria and the immediate present. <clears throat> Debate is about to come to a head, and uh, there obviously will be far-reaching consequences as to how it plays out. I'd like to, you to tell us what you think about the Russian proposal today to put the Syrian chemical weapons under international control. Is that helpful, or is that mischief-making? Well, it's one of the two. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Admiral Carter and I were talking about this. In, 1980, in 1990 and 91, we, he and I were in very different places. He was on, out in the CENTCOM area of operations on carriers and so forth. I was the, the Middle East guy at the National Security Council at the White House. I was in charge of that part of the world, working for Brent Scowcroft and President Bush 41. One of the things we did and we had prepared then was we thought it was quite possible that at some point, as we, if you recall, uh, in the fall of 19, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in early August of uh, 90. In the fall, in November of 1990, the UN passed the resolution saying that unless he's out completely and unconditionally, unless he's out of Kuwait by January 15th, countries may use all necessary means to achieve that uh, goal. We thought somewhere in late December, early January, as it got really close, we thought that Saddam Hussein was gonna start doing things like the Russians seem to have done today with Syria. We thought that he was gonna start saying, well, I'll get out of a little bit of Kuwait and I'll do a little bit of this and I'll do a little bit of that. And one of the things we had prepared, and it was done at the interagency level, was that if Saddam put out any sort of a proposal that gained any traction whatsoever. We weren't going to accept it. We weren't going to reject it. But rather, we were going to test it. And what we did was said, OK, we put it together on paper that basically said, uh, here's where you need to be by certain time things. So in 48 hours, you have to have achieved this. In 72 hours, you have to achieve this. Basically, we gave him a t set of tests. This is all on paper to test his bona fides, whether it was just a tactic or whether it was sincere. And if so, if he had started doing things and he met these tests, then we would have held our fire. On the other hand, if, he, if it looked like it was just a tactic to interfere with decision making and implementation, we were going to say, not good enough. Here we go. That's what I think our reaction ought to be now, that we ought to basically say to ourselves, look, uh, what, were, what would be our conditions? And off the top of my head, it would be such things that he gives up, he agrees to give up all of his chemical weapons. Before that, he has to give a full accounting of all his chemical weapons. He has to agree to intrusive inspections. He would agree to sign the Chemical Weapons Convention. We'd agree to some kind of a rate of destruction or international transfer. We'd probably have some kind of custody of the weapons in the meantime. So we would have a set, what I, what I would recommend that the White House be doing, I hope they've done it, is they would basically come up with their test of bona fides. And so you, you continue to march towards whatever military options you're going to do, as if none of this was going to happen. So you continue to press things with the Congress and all that. I, don't, I didn't favor the decision to go to Congress, but we are where we are. So you continue to move towards getting congressional support for the use, or congressional authorization, rather, for the use of force. Uh, as if none of this is going to work. At the same time, you say, look, we're prepared to uh, accept this as an alternative outcome, but here's our, here's our criteria. And if you're willing and able to meet them, then great. There's an alternative. I actually think even more that it actually helps the president in one way, because one could argue that the threat of the use of force potentially is one of the things that has led the Russians and potentially the Syrians to be attracted to this idea. Uh, I would say if that's the case, we might want to stop talking about how modest the use of force is going to be. Uh, but um, it's a funny approach to coercive diplomacy, let me just say. But, the, uh, but I would basically, I pursue both tracks. Uh, and 
you know, I think in life you have to be willing to take yes for an answer. So you frame the questions, though, and the test. So if, if they were met, you could live with it. And that, but you don't allow yourself, if you will, to be distracted, or you don't allow it just to be used as a tactic. So it ought to be, very, it ought to be demanding, but not unreasonable. And that would be my, that would be my modest or immodest recommendation. Sure, one more, last one. Sir, Commander Alexander. Firstly, I think that this era after the Cold War could be termed Pax Americanus, just for our overreach. Secondly, you talked mostly about uh, America grand strategy and all these areas. What, what I haven't heard from this, this discussion is, what is the responsibility of the international community? We're moving over to... to sure. You got it. <laughs> oh, sorry, I missed the last couple of words. <laughs> I wouldn't quite call it a Pax Americana, for, in part because it's not quite a Pax. And it's clearly an era of American primacy, no doubt. And America is first and has been and is first among unequals, and the gap is quite large. But it's not an era of Pax Americana because we're not able to impose peace. We couldn't do it on Iraq or Afghanistan despite what? Well, more than two million American soldiers s cycled through Afghanistan and Iraq at one time. You know, we spent a trillion, a trillion and a half dollars. We couldn't do it. Uh, we can't, we haven't been able to prevent, you know, you can't prevent the rise of nations. You can't prevent the expressions of nationalism. There's a, the United States doesn't have control. We're not a hegemon. Again, we're the most influential country in the world. But given globalization, given the diffusion of power, given our own political constraints and so forth, it's not hegemony. It's something less. It's significant, but less. And we're kind of living in that gray area. Uh, my own sense is, again, I think we've made it messier than it ought to have been because at times we've tried to do too much. And again, my current concern is we might be entering a period where we're doing too little. And I worry about, again, the, the erosion of our power here at home. So what I'd love to do is extend this period of American primacy. That's, that's essentially my goal. Uh, international community. Okay, so I said before I banned the phrase Arab Spring. Uh, I also don't use the phrase international community. Uh, the reason is there ain't one. Uh, uh, it's good you're all sitting down, uh, but there isn't one. Uh, that, that might be a goal. Indeed, in a previous book, I talked about the idea of uh, one of the goals ought to be to knit together more of an international community. And I still believe that's the case, to deal with proliferation, terrorism, climate change, disease, protectionism, you know, all the threats to global order in whatever sphere. But there isn't much of an international community today because the, the, there isn't a consensus on what ought to be the rules and the arrangements that would shape international relations. Look at the G20 last couple days ago. G20 got turned into the G11, because only 11 countries could agree on what could be said about chemical uh, weapons in Syria. So there's been zero progress at the global level on climate change. World trade talks are moribund. There's two trade negotiations that are significant going on, one's across the Atlantic, one's selectively in the Pacific. The, the UN, the Security Council, rather than being an expression of international community, is more an example of my point. That, yeah, there's rare, there's rare occasions where the five permanent members with vetoes agree. We talked for a second ago about uh, Saddam Hussein and the invasion of Kuwait, that was one of them. But that, was probably one of the very few areas where there is a degree of international community, which is the concept of sovereign immunity. And the countries ought not to cross borders and invade other countries. But there's, there's virtually, uh, there's this very little agreement on anything else. So, uh, so I, I take two lessons for that. We're not, it's very rare we're going to get complete international uh, backing or participation in efforts to uphold our visions of order, and we're often not going to get it through the UN. So what, that, what does that mean is you, you end up going for international support where you can, and you end up forum shopping sometimes. 
you look for other fora besides the UN. For example, in the Balkans, we went to NATO, where you go to coalitions of the willing or, or, or what have you. And you get countries to pitch in where they're willing and able to. Now, again, the long-term diplomatic goal ought to be to, if you will, translate the concept of international community from an objective to more of a reality. And that, to me, is that's a pretty good task for diplomats. I would actually say that's one element of uh, what I think we ought to be doing in the world, is consulting a lot with countries to try to uh, get them to think that way, why it's in their own self-interest to do certain things. Uh, and I, and I, so I think that's, that's, that's more. But in the meantime, we've got to accept the fact that international community isn't a reality and that we have to find, if you will, multilateralism where we can. And that means a much more, I once wrote, I once gave a speech uh, in my last job at the State Department and I talked about uh, multilateralism a la carte. And I think that's the approach. You basically, it's not a prefix dinner. It's not one size fits all. You, you, you do kind of designer multilateralism. And in every instance you say, where can I, you know, what principles or what goals can I build a meaningful amount of international support? And how can I get there? Do I create a new institution? Do I use an existing one? How ambitious am I in the degree of uh, what I'm asking people to sign up to? And that to me, that's the stuff of foreign policy. And I, and I just think that's where we are for this era of history. But a long-term goal ought to be to move the world in that direction. And I would hope that in the course of this century, uh, through consultations, uh, the United States and China and India and Russia, Japan, Europe, Mexico, Brazil, you know, the major, basically the, G20, G, the G8 or the G20 countries, make progress towards that. And that would go a long way towards having this be a more orderly uh, century. And that'll be actually I'll actually leave you, leave you one last idea, and then I'll stop, because it's 8 o'clock. And we, even if we don't start on time, we end on time. Uh, <laughs> important, yeah, you've got to set precedence here, uh, Admiral. Uh, the, um, which is if there's this gap right now between global challenges, threats, what have you, and global arrangements, there's an enormous gap in virtually every domain of international life. Because there isn't a policy consensus, or there aren't the institutions, or both. That order, to narrow that gap seems to me a really intelligent goal for American foreign policy. Uh, to try to, over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever years, 30 years, to see where we can't persuade others to sign up to uh, rules, or to use the word of the day, norms, arrangements, what have you, in these various domains or facets of international existence, and to work with us to promote them, to discourage people from violating them. That, to me, is a pretty good definition of what we're trying to do in, um, this year. So you know, it would be great to come back here sometime and to say, you know, we're actually we're making progress towards building an international community. And you know, there is some now. I'm not saying there's none. I'm sorry. I, I don't, I don't want to be you know, flippant about that. There, there are elements of it now. Uh, but what we want to do is uh, broaden, deepen it. And that, to me, is as good definition of what our goals ought to be in foreign policy as anything else. Okay? Great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ambassador Haas, uh, on behalf of uh, everyone here, our, our uh, U.S. military students, our international students, our faculty, uh, the members of the uh, U.S. Naval War College Foundation and their guests, I want to say how much we really appreciate you coming out here to spend time with us this evening. Uh, as you know, the mission here at the Naval War College is to educate leaders. Uh, that's a great banner, but really it's all about understanding how decisions are shaped, advised, and made for us in uniform and for those who make policy. And tonight you gave us through uh, your transparent, your intellectual thought, uh, so much to think about, and uh, we're very appreciative of that. So uh, please, everyone, let's uh, give a, a round thank you, uh, applause. Thank you.